Hello and welcome to the Road to Genome podcast. I'm your host, Helen Bethel, Genetic Counselor and Workforce Development and Education Lead for the North Eastern Yorkshire Genomic Medicine Service, or GMS. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Polly Tully. Hi, Polly. Hello. I'm going to start by asking you, how many job titles and hats do you currently wear in your roles? Currently, it's quite a lot. My basic role is a clinical scientist uh, and I work in Leeds at HMDS doing uh, the genetics of patients that have leukaemia and lymphoma. I also have a title as the Hemonc Lead Scientist for the North Eastern Yorkshire GLH. Uh, and I work part time for NHS England as part of their genomics unit. And my role within the genomics unit is, is, is as the um, senior scientific advisor, again, for Hemonc. So all leukemia and lymphoma related. Wow, that sounds incredible, all those titles. And I'm really looking forward to hearing a little bit more about each of those. Before we go on, can you just explain? what we mean by hemonc. So hemonc is um, hematological oncology and that really is the cancer of blood. Um, so it includes leukemia and lymphoma. So it is cancer uh, of the blood and the lymph. Great. Thank you. So what do each of those job roles mean then? So with the scientific role, I'm part of a huge team across northeastern Yorkshire and indeed other national teams that do very similar mm-hmm. jobs, diagnosing and monitoring uh, patients with leukemia and lymphoma. Mm-hmm. You can use the genetics to determine the type of leukemia and it can sometimes give you information on the prognosis for the patients and indeed how they might respond to particular drugs. Okay. So the day job is basically looking at how genetics can be used to diagnose and look after patients with leukemia. That sounds incredibly interesting and rewarding, is it? I love it. I've been in the job for a long time, but my enthusiasm doesn't doesn't seem to have waned after even 30 years. That's fantastic. That's great. The lead scientist role within the GLH is a role that's come around since we formed the GLHs in 2018. And we have three lead scientists within GLH. So there's one for Hemonc, which is myself, and Mm -hmm. then we have another person who is a lead scientist for solid tumours and another scientist who leads the rare disease components. Mm -hmm. So we do work as a team of three, Mm -hmm. um, but managing our own different areas separately. Yeah. And then finally, the uh, senior scientific advisor role within NHS England. I've been doing that for nearly three years now. So mm-hmm. that's a relatively new role to me. But that's working with the team in NHS England to look at how best we manage the strategy and testing that we need for our hemonc patients. That's been a real challenging role and has put me out of my comfort zone in many ways. But it's also been incredibly rewarding because I feel as though they want to find out how best we can manage the testing for our patients and want to know how we can get the best out of the genomic testing that we have available for the hemonc patients. So working on those strategies and how that can actually help our patients is, has been really rewarding. Yeah, that sounds incredible to be balancing the work that you're doing, like you say, at that national strategy level, but also still be dealing with cases and um, the actual testing. And are you still involved from a lab perspective in kind of reporting and, and yeah. dealing with cases? I do a lot less than I used to, but I still do, I still do on a weekly basis get involved in reporting cases. I trained as a cytogeneticist, so that was what I learned to do right in the beginning. Uh, And I do very little carrier typing these days. I've kind of moved on to other areas, but I'm still heavily involved in FISH, in MLPA technologies, reporting, next-gen sequencing, and whole genome sequencing for hemonc patients. Fantastic. Um, I also am heavily involved in some of the MDTs, particularly leads Mm. Related. Mm -hmm. And so that's uh, working with the rest of the teams that are Mm -hmm. involved in looking after the patients. And we meet on a weekly basis to discuss the patients, what their genomics means, and how the genomics fits into all of the other aspects of their um, management. And again, that's really rewarding to see where the genomics fits amongst everything else. Yeah, I think it's fantastic to hear that 
you know, you're still practicing as a clinical scientist, as you say, maybe less than you used to, but it's great to hear that you've still got that shop floor experience on a weekly basis mm-hmm. that you can bring into that strategy level work that you're doing and vice versa. It's fantastic that you're, you're able to kind of sit yeah. with all those hats on. It must be quite a juggle for you. It is, is a it, juggle, yeah. but I also think that was recognised by the NHSE mm-hmm. uh, genomics unit. Mm-hmm. They wanted somebody who uh, was still on the shop floor, as you say. Yeah. Um, and so s- somebody who could actually say, yes, this will work mm-hmm. in a GLH or no, this won't. We need to think about doing it slightly differently. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. So let me ask then, was this where you thought you'd be as a child? Is this what you aimed for when you were at school? That's a really challenging question because I don't know if I'm completely (laughs) honest. I always at school loved biology and science. So I think from a very early age, I knew that I wanted to do something along those lines. Mm -hmm. But genomics in the way that it is now, I don't know that it even existed. So I certainly didn't know that that was what I wanted to do uh, when I was at school, for example. Mm -hmm. And realistically, I don't think I even knew what cytogenetics was until I was at university. Yeah, I went to York University and I had a tutor that followed me sort of through the three Mm -hmm. years. Her name was Sue Borgard and she was actually um, trained as a cytogeneticist. She didn't like it and decided she wanted to be a lecturer and worked in the university. But it was Sue who said, this is something you could consider. I think it would be a job that would suit you. And that was really what prompted me to even look in that direction. Yeah, fantastic. So so what would, did you say your degree was in, sorry, so in York? I did a degree in biological sciences, okay. but chose, it was, it's one of these modular ones, which I'm aware many of them are these days, where you can pick the bits that yeah. you want to do in second and third years. And yeah. I did pick all of the genetics components. So actually my degree is a genetics degree. degree. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So does that run in the family then? Are you from a family of scientists? Not at all. <laughs> um, and uh, it's a, a a bit of a joke in our family that I'm a, I'm the black sheep. So my parents are both hippies. They met at um, wow. art school in the 60s. And so art is very much their world. Yeah. And I still think to this day they're really surprised that they uh, they have a scientist <laughs> daughter. Yeah. So yeah, definitely the black sheep. It wasn't a family thing. Yeah. And do they take much interest in it? Have they found it kind of relevant to them at all, the work that you do? Uh, yes, yes, they're interested. I think from a distance, in many ways, they're slightly in awe, but I think proud of you know where I've ended up and what I've what I've ended up doing. So yeah, great. So when you left university, you went into being a cytogenetist. Yeah. So what was the role like back then when you first entered the career path? So I did my training in Sheffield, so in the Sheffield Children's Hospital, and that's where my training started. And it was a very different world. You know, many of the techniques that we know and take for granted now weren't Mm -hmm. even available at that stage. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the things that we look for and, you know, the the actual targets that we're looking for in leukemia patients now weren't known. Mm -hmm. It was only really a couple of years after I started as a trainee that we introduced fish into the laboratory. And it's hard to imagine that fish hasn't always existed. But yeah, we introduced that into the laboratory in in 1995. So before you mentioned fish, you were just looking directly down the microscope at the chromosomes where you were observing them by eye. So can you just explain a little bit then what fish is in terms of the technique and how that differs from just looking down the microscope? So fish allows you to use fluorescently labelled probes Mm -hmm. to a target of interest. Mm -hmm. And you go through the process and you, you basically attach those probes to the DNA and it allows you to visualise um, spatially down the microscope and a fluorescent microscope this time rather than a light microscope mm-hmm. where those signals are. So it's ideal for looking to see whether there are deletions present. So mm-hmm. you would see loss of one of your signals. Yeah. Over time, the probe manufacturers have developed more sophisticated designs that mm-hmm. allow you to pick up rearrangements of wow. specific genes. It does give you a a single question. You say, Mm -hmm. is there a BCR able rearrangement? And you get a yes, no answer. Yeah. So it isn't like cytogenetics where you are looking, uh, albeit at a low resolution level, at the whole genome. Yeah. Uh, So they are very much complementary techniques. Yeah. Yeah. And are they still used today? 
Again, over time, things have changed, but certainly within Hemonc, fish still plays a, an extremely important role and we still use uh, mm-hmm. fish techniques now. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are seeing cytogenetics beginning to be used less as newer techniques come on. So, for example, within a group of patients with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, mm-hmm. we used to have cytogenetics really as our mainstay testing. Mm-hmm. And that's uh, almost wholly been replaced by snip array technologies mm-hmm. and fish mm-hmm. with next gen sequencing as well. Yeah. And those patients are also eligible for whole genome sequencing, yeah. which has been available just for the last um, maybe three years. Yeah. Thanks so much for explaining already. It's really interesting to hear the differences between those techniques. So can you just explain a little bit about how kind of whole genome sequencing might be used in a hemonc kind of space? So whole genome sequencing where we read the whole of a person's genome. How does that apply in a in a hemonc case? So we have really only been offering that as part of the GMS for a very short amount of time. So um, three years, approaching mm-hmm. three years. Mm-hmm. And... We have a limited number of patients who are eligible for that. So patients who have AML mm-hmm. or ALL mm-hmm. are eligible to be submitted for whole genome sequencing. Currently, there are issues mm-hmm. uh, in that that takes quite a long time to go through the process of getting the samples together. Mm-hmm. It isn't just sending a sample of the patient's bone marrow. Mm-hmm. You do need to send a germline sample as well. Mm-hmm. And there's a complex process of subtraction mm-hmm. of the okay. germline mm-hmm. findings against the tumour so that okay. you know what you're looking at, germline versus somatic okay. changes. Yeah. Yeah. It can take a long time for those samples to be gathered together. Mm -hmm. The germline samples for hemonc are challenging. They tend to require a skin biopsy Mm -hmm. because you can't use a blood because obviously the blood is part of Of the the tumour. Yeah. So they are samples that aren't necessarily easy to get hold of and Mm -hmm. we don't always get consent for those. Mm -hmm. So right now... The uh, whole genome sequencing is being carried out as a an adjunct to the standard of care testing. Yeah, I think a few things need to change before that situation will change, mm-hmm. and until we can see whole genome sequencing as standard of care, mm-hmm. it has to be quicker. Mm-hmm. So realistically, you would need a result within two weeks in order yeah. to be able to treat and manage the patient yeah. appropriately with their genomic findings, yeah. uh, and currently that's taking much longer it's often more like three months before you get a result on your whole genome sequencing yeah 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 that's fascinating Mm. thank you if we think about a typical case then what does this involve for you I know you mentioned you're doing less case work but you know kind of with all your other roles but what does a typical case in involve for you We actually manage a huge range of different uh, leukaemia types Mm -hmm. and each of those cases is slightly different Mm -hmm. in the way that they're managed from a genomics perspective. So genomics is able to give quite a lot of information in some uh, and then much less in others and Mm -hmm. it's used um, less for treatment strategies, for Mm -hmm. example. If we were to look at a patient with acute lymphoblastic leukaemia, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. the genomics plays a really quite substantial part in the diagnosis, mm-hmm. the prognosis, and how those patients are treated. Mm-hmm. They are the patients that I tend to be involved with the MDTs for as mm-hmm. well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I guess they're a, a good example. But mm-hmm. as a new patient presenting with a suspected ALL, mm-hmm. uh, we would do a whole series of testing pretty much up front. Mm-hmm. So we have two panels of fish testing that we do mm-hmm. and a SNP array up front. Mm-hmm. And then that can trigger further fish testing if required. Mm-hmm. And then again, if you don't see any of the standard classifying rearrangements, yeah. you would then go on to do an RNA fusion panel. So that's looking at a broad next generation sequencing process to look at 500 plus genes for mm-hmm. rearrangements as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then alongside that, those patients are the ones that are eligible for whole genome sequencing too. Yeah. Yeah, so it sounds incredible, the, you know, kind of those using of different techniques and trying to find the answers and, you know, almost kind of being almost like a detective trying to work out those answers, yeah. And which part of the role do you think is most challenging for you? 
It probably is that from a genetic perspective, it's those cases that are the most challenging, mm -hmm. but they are also the most rewarding. As you say, it's, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. You, you want to get the puzzle right and right quickly so that you can get the results back to patients as soon as possible. Yep. So they're the ones that I find most challenging, um, but also the most rewarding. Yeah, fantastic. How many years is it now that you've been a clinical scientist within NEY? Working right back to when I started my training, it's just over 30 years. Wow. Yeah, That's a long time. That makes me feel old. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> an incredible achievement. And what has changed in that time then, do you think? A huge amount. And I think, you know, even uh, reflecting um, for this podcast, again, going back to the ALL patients, you know, patients with leukemia did really poorly. And only about 50% um, of patients survived with leukemia when I started mm -hmm. in the early 90s. Yeah. And we've seen such a sort of revolution, not only in the genomics, but mm -hmm. in the way that patients are treated mm -hmm. and then in the way that treatments have progressed as mm -hmm. well. So you would now see, you would expect 90 plus percent of wow. ALL patients to survive these days. Wow, and that just incredible. feels huge, yeah. that change. Yeah. And I guess within within that 30 years as well, we've seen the sort of advent of the, the drugs that are designed against specific changes mm -hmm. so really the first one of those was a drug called imatinib mm -hmm. which was designed for patients with chronic myeloid leukemia cml okay. mm -hmm. and that's a drug that was specifically targets the bcr able tyrosine kinase domain which mm -hmm. is the rearrangement that you see associated okay. mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. cml and that, that targeted that particular rearrangement and has really changed what was a once fatal disease into a manageable disease with a normal, near normal lifespan now. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. It does feel incredible. And that, so that was in 2001, Amatinib was released in the UK. Yeah. And we've now seen more and more of those targetable drugs that are specifically able to treat patients with genomics that fit that particular target. Yeah, it's absolutely wonderful to hear the science and you hearing about the domains that are used in, in hearing how that really is impacting on kind of the front line of mm. patients being delivered treatments. And I know we've talked in the other podcasts with other professionals about how much I think a common factor with us all is our love for science and actually bringing yeah. that to people and just hearing you talk then it just how close that is of you know kind of literally knowing the change that has occurred in that patient and being able to target that treatment um, so precisely and yes. using your work as a clinical scientist to absolutely pinpoint that and know to receive that result and know you know exactly that there's going to be a treatment for this patient must, yeah, must feel incredible. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever met any of the patients whose results you've worked on then face-to-face? -face? My day-to-day -day job doesn't include any patient-facing mm -hmm. stuff, but I have over um, over my years done, done a little bit. So as I mentioned, the MDTs, the multidisciplinary team meetings, mm -hmm. uh, I am involved in on a weekly basis. And although the patients aren't part of those meetings, you do feel as though you very much understand the patient and mm -hmm. the family scenario mm -hmm. um, and, you know, how they are they're managing their diagnosis. We do have a number of patient requests to come and see a laboratory. So certainly in HMDS, wow. we do allow people to come and have a look around the laboratory and particularly patient focus groups to come and see what goes on. Okay. So it means that we can actually remove some of that uh, sort of dark laboratory stuff. Yeah, and the people, mystery. Yeah, yeah, and if they can see what goes on, it feels less of a challenge for them and it gives a bit, a bit of understanding for the patients as to what's going on with their samples when they've had them taken. Yeah. And then um, more recently, I have completed a PhD looking at the genomics of myeloma patients. Mm -hmm. My PhD supervisor is a, a Hemonc consultant. Yes. And he runs a number of uh, myeloma clinics. Yeah. And as part of the PhD, I sat in on a number of those clinics. And for me, that was really brilliant to be able to see, you know, how patients manage the news, what their understanding is of the genomics, and really what a range there is as well. 
I was completely in awe of um, Andy Chantry being able to assess what the patient's needs Mm -hmm. were Mm -hmm. by way of information almost as soon as they walked in. Wow. Uh, Some patients really do want to know everything. They want to understand their disease, its course, the genetics, what their treatments will do, you know, in Mm -hmm. in minute detail. Yeah. And others just don't want that information. They Mm -hmm. are quite happy to hand over to the doctor and, you know, really are in a situation where they'll say whatever you say, doctor. Yeah. Yeah. And that that was uh, very different for me to see that that end of it. And in, in many ways makes it much more real. I don't think I ever forget that there's a patient on the end of mm-hmm. the samples that I'm dealing mm-hmm. with. Mm-hmm. But it, it, I don't think it's a bad thing to just be reminded. Yeah. Well, huge congratulations on your PhD. That, you. What an incredible <laughs> achievement in amongst, again, all those hats that you're juggling. And I have to say, as a genetic counsellor, it's wonderful to hear that you're considering the patient in amongst all the science that you're using, actually the the patient at the end of it and the those kind of qualitative elements that are you know kind of picked upon in in the clinic so that's fantastic can I ask you then what does a good day look like for you then at work what's a good day at work again that's quite a challenging question (laughs) because it's uh, every day seems to be different yeah I still get a great deal out of doing the uh, clinical scientist job Mm -hmm. so a good day to me is the ones where I can do some real science yeah so I can do some analysis do some report writing yeah I really like working with the teams as Mm -hmm. well and within the sort of network that we've got across northeastern Yorkshire the teams are across uh, three sides Mm -hmm. and we have some amazing people that work within our teams and I enjoy uh, interacting with those Mm -hmm. people you know understanding what what drives them and what they can offer you know we've got some very bright people with sort of real innovations and really great stuff to offer so being part of those teams is really good yeah I do like the more managerial side of things but that tends to be more isolated in some ways yeah yeah so on the flip side what's a more challenging day for you then at work I guess the more challenging days are the days where the politics gets in the way of Mm -hmm. the service. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean, you know, there there are difficulties within Mm -hmm. the NHS currently. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think there always have been, but I think financially Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't got the support that we would like. Mm -hmm. So we often feel as though the teams are really stretched. Mm -hmm. We don't always have the equipment we want. Mm -hmm. We don't always have the ability to do the developments that we would like to Mm do. And yeah, that that's probably what I find the most challenging when we when we can't do the job that we want to do yeah. because the resources aren't there to support. Yeah, yeah. And I, I guess going back to your different roles, hopefully being involved with that strategy at, at a national level might help towards maybe addressing some of those issues that, yeah. you know, as I say, you're gaining all that experience on the shop floor to be able to feed that into to the strategy work that's being done yeah. at, an, at a national level. And it does mean that we can, you know, make sure that the money is focused in the areas that we yeah. think are mm-hmm. most important. Mm-hmm. But certainly, the, as you know, the financial considerations across the NHS mm-hmm. uh, are there for mm-hmm. all sections and all mm-hmm. areas, yeah. 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 What do you think is the most exciting kind of bit that's coming down the tracks then in the kind of near or in the distant future? What's most exciting in Hemonk coming up? There's there's a lot. There always is. I mean, genomics is an area that moves really fast. Mm -hmm. But I'm currently involved with a number of projects that I think are exciting and I think will um, be exciting in the future. So very recently, we have set up within the genomics unit a series of uh, networks of excellence. Yep. So there are currently nine networks of excellence, and there is one on Hemonk. Mm -hmm. And I have been quite heavily involved in um, shaping that, but also uh, leading that alongside one of my clinical colleagues, Mm -hmm. Angela Hamblin. Mm-hmm. So within the network of excellence, we've been asked to set up work packages mm-hmm. and there are six within Hemonk mm-hmm. and those cover areas where we felt there was space for improvement mm-hmm. or areas that could really benefit from something slightly different. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And just to pick a couple of examples, yep. we want to focus on the um, whole genome sequencing 
as a faster turnaround. Mm -hmm. I mentioned that that sort of three-month turnaround doesn't work Make for Hemong. Mm -hmm. And it won't ever be standard of care testing if it's got a three-month turnaround time. Yeah. So one of the work packages is looking to really streamline that process to mm -hmm. ideally get it down to within seven to ten days. Wow. That's a two-year aim, yeah, and I think a very challenging aim, yeah. But I also can see the real sort of patient impact that that would have mm -hmm. if we really could achieve that. Yeah, there's another work package that's looking at myeloma, mm -hmm. and that's a leukemia involving your plasma cells. Mm -hmm. At the moment, myeloma patients are, um, they're challenging to diagnose. They involve mm -hmm. quite a lot of testing that isn't very high throughput. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And again, the treatments aren't always targeted to the uh, abnormalities that we mm -hmm. pick up from a genomic perspective. Mm -hmm. But there's a team that have been looking at a process, which is a next generation sequencing process, mm -hmm. to look at a single test that would give you all of the targets that you would look for yep. in myeloma in a single test, test. Yep. which just sounds ideal. Yeah. Again, I think that's challenging within the two-year scope of the project, mm -hmm. uh, but it is a piece of work that's been used already as part of a current trial. Mm -hmm. So it's really taking it from that trial arena into business as usual mm -hmm. within the NHS. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, those both sound incredible projects yeah, and I'm sure the other four are, are just as interesting as, as well. So I really look forward to hearing more about those yeah. in the in the next couple of years and uh, fingers crossed you do manage to get some of those really ambitious targets but ag again incredible to hear your passion for it and your drive for it yeah. and always you know what comes across is you always keep in the patient at the center of that so the reason you want those results is to make it impactful and make it actually count in terms absolutely. of their diagnosis and their treatment so it's absolutely wonderful to hear so you mentioned your PhD and obviously you've got your national role as well but where do you feel like your ambition is going to take you next? Again, I'm not, I don't know. <laughs> I have really enjoyed working with NHS England. It's a job that I took on as a secondment role mm -hmm. initially, partly because I didn't know exactly what was expected mm -hmm. or what the role would mm -hmm. uh, look like. And although, as I've touched on, it probably is the most challenging of the areas, it's also an area where I feel I can actually make a difference. And so I like the idea of being able to shape the testing for our hemonc patients and being able to do that with the knowledge I have from being on the shop floor, mm -hmm. I hope means that I would do that in a sensible way. So that that probably is where I feel my sort of future direction. Mm. Yeah. 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 Well, it's been absolutely fantastic talking to you, Polly. Thank you so Thank much you. for coming along today. Thank you very much. And thanks for listening. If you're interested in the topics we have discussed today, then you can find some relevant links on our website, www.ny-genomics.org.uk forward slash podcast. Never miss an episode by subscribing on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your podcasts.